tonight. The final word. The Supreme Court begins hearing submissions from 19 Port City Economic Commission bill challenges. Patience is a virtue. The Cardinal clarifies yesterday's misconstrued comments and promises not to give up his search for justice. We will observe the situation some more and we'll give them time to. It is a very long process. We'll be patient. Round two. Health officials announce the commencement of the second vaccine shots from the first week of May. Much appreciated. The rupee selling rate does a U-turn and improves to its best level since January. All this and much more coming up on this Monday, the 19th of April, 2021. Alcohol adangu hand sanitizer bavita karanna. Lady roga ati karanna visha bija. From Adha Verana, this is Adha Verana first at nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I am Shanella Fernando. In your top stories for tonight, the hearing of submissions challenging the legality of specific clauses in the proposed Port City Economic Commission Bill commenced today by a five-member bench of the Supreme Court. The total of 19 petitions have been filed by private individuals, civil society activists and opposition political parties who claim that some clauses in the bill undermine the country's sovereignty and take away the parliament's power of oversight on the activities of the commission. The Supreme Court is set to reconvene tomorrow to continue with the submissions. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill has been included in the Order Book of Parliament. With that, the consideration of the petitions filed against the bill was held before a five-member bench of the Supreme Court today. The five-member bench consists of Chief Justice Jayanta Jasuria and Supreme Court Judges Buvaneka Alvihare, Priyanta Jayavardhana, Murudu Fernando and Janakti Silva. Speaking in open court before the commencement of the hearing, Chief Justice Jayanth Jayasuriya requested each legal counsel to limit their oral submissions to 20 to 30 minutes each due to the number of petitions that have been filed. Nearly 20 petitions had been submitted against the draft bill by many parties, including Chairman of the United National Party Vajira Abevardhana, UMP General Secretary Parita Rangi Bandara, former Janata Vimukti Paramuna MP Vasanta Samrasingha, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, the Centre for Policy Alternatives, General Secretary of the Samagi Janabalavegya, Ranjit Madhuba Bandara, and Chairman of the Association of IT Professionals, Kapila Renko Pereira. Further, Chairman of the Sri Lanka Pudujana Perumuna, Professor G.L. Piris, SLPP General Secretary, Attorney at Law Sagar Karivasam, and the SLPP Legal Association also filed interim petitions in order to make submissions. The petitioners challenging the bill claim that certain of its clauses are in violation of the country's constitution. Further, the petitioners seek a Supreme Court ruling that will require the clauses in the bill be passed by a two-thirds majority in Parliament and a referendum. When submissions got underway, President's Counsel K. Kanagisvarin, appearing for the Centre for Policy Alternatives, pointed out that although Parliament has full financial power and the power to impose taxes, Article 40 of this bill delegates the power to impose taxes without the approval of Parliament to the Port City Economic Commission. He warned that the proposed bill would create a situation where the country's financial and banking laws are not followed and would create a paradise for money laundering in the Port City zone. On this basis, the President's Council requested the bench to rule that the draft is unconstitutional as only the Supreme Court held the powers to stop such unconstitutional acts. Further, Attorney at Law Darshana Veraduage, appearing for the President of the Association of ID Professionals, Kapila Renuko Perera, pointed out that in accordance with the Constitution, land is a subject that comes under the purview of the country's provincial council system. Accordingly, he pointed out that although it is necessary to refer a bill relating to lands to the provincial councils before it is tabled in Parliament, Parliament has no power to include the bill in the agenda as no such process had been followed. With that, President's Council M. A. Sumandiran, appearing for petitioner Gamani Vyanguda, pointed out that many of the clauses in the bill violate Sri Lankan law. The President's Council also pointed out that on this basis, the Colombo Port City Zone has been made a separate independent state. Meanwhile, Attorney at Law Iraj De Silva, appearing for UMP General Secretary Parita Rangi Bandara, stated that the power to oversee the work of the Commission had been taken away from Parliament, while the power to audit the Commission's financial activities had also been removed from the Auditor General. 
In addition, President's Council Tisat Vijay Gunavaradana, appearing for the General Secretary of the Samagi Janabalavegya, Ranjit Madhuma Bandara, pointed out that Parliament has not been given any opportunity to oversee the process of appointing members to the proposed commission. Following this, further consideration of submissions was suspended until tomorrow. <laughs> At a media briefing held today, Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit stated that his comments at a ceremony held at the General Cemetery in Burala yesterday did not refer to any local political forces but only alluded to international groups such as propagators of Wahhabism using extremism to further their selfish goals. The Cardinal also called on all citizens and religious leaders to join the Catholic community in observing two-minute silence at 8.45 a.m on Thursday morning, the time when the first bomb went off at the St. Anthony Shrine in Kochikade. Mama iya kia pude vera di vidir terung arantino, moga de mama kiu vene rate muslim mantava de aksa viaptava de akriat maka vene ne hekiela. Muslim viaptava de sa antava de ke ne kesa krastava de to yomu ima pili bande tatwe muslim jana tawa te api he tu karande ane ne he ke sulu piri sak karna vera kwen na pulwa. Namut e aya atering. जातियांतर बालपैम निशा ये आय अतरीन में नमक गिया पिरिस में विधि हटे अंतवाद ये टे एब्बेही वेला विशेष एम वहाब वाद ये कीने कटे यातात वेला पिरिस इंदु इस्लामीय चिंतने इन यम्मा कार्य कटे पिटवी काटियो तो करान्ने योम वेला थी नो ऐनिशा मेथने दी में ये वैरदी आधासा कैविला थी ने किसी में देश वहाँ वादे किएने का बालेगातु देशपाल ने लोग के राठवाल वाला अतकोलु बावटे पत्तेला तीनों आ वेन्ना पुलवा एक याने समार वेला वटे अदल लोग के तीनों आ में आयुध निष्पादने करने विशाल समागम में समागम उत्साह करनो आ लोग के विविध टैंग वाले जाति इन्हा आगमी के अन्ना तरह केटवी म ऐतिहारवेला � देदास दाना में अप्रैल विषय के उदय आटाई हातलिस पहाड़ पाले में नी बॉम्बे कोचिकाडे सांत अंतोनी देवास्थाने पुपुरा गिये निशा अभी उदय आटाई हातलिस पहाड़ आपे देवास्थान वेले बिना डी देखक निहंड तावे आरक्षा करने के लिए अभी आपे जनता वगे निलला थिए ना अभी इल्ली मार करना मुलु राते म जनता वगे विशेष एन म आपे आगमी का नायक एंगे ये बिना डी देखे निशब्द तावे आरक्षा करला अभी तक के एकतु एन न किए ला इन द मीन टाइम हिज एमिनेंस द कार्डिनल रेस्पोंडेड टू जर्नलिस्ट क्वेश्� the deadline was only a terminus ad quem because what we wanted was an effective program and we want to continue to show that our people are with us and we will continue our struggle until we get a clear indication that the government is keen to investigate thoroughly the whole matter and reveal to the public because it's not a question only of Catholics and Christians. It's a question of the country, country's security and safety for the future. Meanwhile, responding to a question raised on whether he would resort to international assistance in his search for justice, the Cardinal stated that he will give the government time to take the required action and ensure justice for the victims. We will observe the situation some more and we will give them time to do whatever they have to do because it is a very long process. We know we can't get immediate targets and deadlines we cannot give. We will be patient but we won't abandon the main struggle. The main struggle will go on one way or the other but we want our people to be told why 269 innocent people who had no reason or rhyme to be attacked were attacked and murdered in cold blood and why nearly 300 people have been rendered destitute and disabled we want to know why and who did it and who sponsored it and all these things we want to know Attorney General Dapula de Oliveira has filed an appeal before the Supreme Court challenging the order by the trial at bar granting bail to the bond scam suspects. The coordinating officer of the Attorney General State Council, Nishara Jarvatna, announced today. On April 1st, former Minister Ravi Karuna Nayaka and seven suspects 
who were accused in another bond scam case were granted bail by the trial at bar comprising of judges Amal Ranaraja, Namal Balale and Aditya Patabandige. On the 17th of March 2021, the eight suspects were placed in remand custody on charges of criminal misappropriation of 15 billion rupees during the Central Bank's Treasury bond auction held between the 29th and 31st of March in 2016. The suspects were released on cash bail of 1 million rupees and two sureties of 10 million rupees each. Further, the bench also imposed a foreign travel ban on all the accused. State Minister of Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals, Professor Channa Jai Sumana said today that the second dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be administered from the first week of May. As such, Chief Epidemiologist at the Epidemiology Unit, Dr. Sudat Samaravira said that the same procedures used in giving out the first dose will be followed. The Epidemiology Unit confirmed 357 COVID-19 cases in Sri Lanka yesterday with the Colombo district reporting the highest cases with 63. Meanwhile, the district of Kurunagala recorded 50 cases of the virus, while the districts of Gampa, Puttalam and Kalutara recorded 41, 30 and 18 cases each, respectively. Meanwhile, 15 infections each were reported from Ratnapura and Jaffna, with Gaul recording 13 COVID-19 cases. Further, 41 cases were recorded from 11 other districts while seven imported cases were also among yesterday's tally. 291 new COVID-19 cases have been confirmed so far. Meanwhile, with the conclusion of the single and Tamil New Year festivities, the streets were filled today with many people moving about, rushing to their places of work. However, despite the constant warnings and advice given by health authorities urging members of the public to adhere to the health and safety guidelines, the warnings had been seen to fall on deaf ears. In other developments, State Minister of Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals, Professor Channa Jaisumanam, said today that the second dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be administered to the public from May. He made these remarks following a meeting held at the Ministry of Health today, headed by Director General of Health Services, Dr. Asela Gunavardana. <laughs> May Mase Palavini Sati Arambe Sita Labadina E Anu Palavini Matra Labadipo Anupilivela Anuma Devan Matra Labadimat Siduenoati. In the meantime, with the recovery of two hundred and sixty one patients today, the country's overall number of recoveries rose to ninety three thousand three hundred and seventy four. As such, the island's active COVID nineteen cases currently stand at three thousand ninety five. A meeting of the leaders of parties under the Sri Lanka Nidahas Podujana Sandhanya that was held today saw 10 parties deciding not to participate in discussions on the holding of provincial council elections. Minister Uday Gamman Pillar, whose Pivitru Hela Urumea party did not attend the discussion, stated that new date is to be set by the Prime Minister for the meeting. A special coalition party leaders meeting was worked off this morning under the patronage of Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa where the subject of the holding of provincial council elections was to be discussed. However, leaders of 10 political parties did not participate in the meeting. The parties absent from the meeting was the National Freedom Front, Pivituru Helorumaya, Democratic Left Front, Lanka Samasamaja Party, the Communist Party of Sri Lanka and the Sri Lanka Mahajana Party. Further, the National Congress, Jatika Janata Peramuna, our People of Power Party and the Yutukama organization too did not join the meeting. After the meeting, the representatives who joined the meeting left the premises without addressing the media. Meanwhile, Pivituru Hela Urumea leader Minister Uday Gamman Pilla outlined the reason why his party and nine others refused to participate in the meeting. Pakshanaikara Sima can do it, I can
However, the Prime Minister's media division says that the parties under the Sri Lanka Nidahas Podujana Sandhanya had held discussions on the upcoming May Day celebrations at the meeting held this morning. All universities in the country will reopen on the 27th of April, Education Minister Professor G.L. Pires announced today. Addressing a press conference at the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna headquarters today, the minister further stated that the reopening of universities will be carried out under strict health and safety guidelines. Adhyapana Pudusatika Saspila Vibhage Api Pavatwane Mayaurude October Hatravanada Sita October Tiswanada Dakwa. Paswana Shrani Shishata Vibhage Api Pavatwane October Tumanada Tama Nepila Vibhage Visai Visi Decade Janavari Mase Avasana Sati. Api Balapurutwana Agostu Mase Nivadu Sati Gata Pavana Kale Kata Sima Kirina. Api Tirna Kalati Veno April Visi Hatunada. Agarwada, Perate, Silo, Isidale, Api, Vutagam. Ava Ekat, Saukia, Nirdesha, Puleta Itama, Daddy Lesser, Avanada women. We should deal with Utaganam, Neva Sigagara, to Halati went to bed. Ava Neva Sigagara, Vutakiri Medi, Samaja Durasta Bave, Atulu, Anek, Saukia Nirdesha, Pilipa de Emma, Visheshen, Vadagatuano. Enisa api itu yang negara tu bina, wisud daya ala ena satiye awam bawa na bintah, mulin ma, hatra bawa na basere, hat tunga na basere, sisian wisud daya ala bintah, kena bina. In pasu, palawini basere, hat dewan basere, sisian tu wisud daya ala anti biurut kiri mata mai, raja salas ma belati bina. Over 89 kilograms of Kerala cannabis were seized in Mana during a joint operation conducted by the Sri Lanka Navy and police. Three suspects were arrested during the operation while a truck used to transport the drugs was taken into custody. Police media spokesperson DIG Ajit Rohana says that the courts have ordered the three suspects be detained for three days for further investigations upon a request by the Mana police. A special search operation was conducted by the North Central Command of the Sri Lanka Navy in the area of Muddalampiddi in Mulankaville last night with the assistance of the Mana Police. During the operation, the team had stopped and searched a suspicious truck that was travelling along the Sipiaru Bridge. Following a search, 89 kilograms and 355 grams of Kerala cannabis stored inside five gunny bags were discovered. Three suspects were then taken into custody and the truck that transported the cannabis of stock was seized. The suspects have been confirmed as the residents of Vaunia and Nanathan. The suspects along with the seized cannabis stock and the truck was handed over to the Mana police for further investigations. Three suspects were produced before the Mana magistrate today and the police sought permission from the court to detain the suspect for a period of three days at police station to conduct further investigation. Accordingly, court has granted the permission and hence the suspect would be detained at Mana police station for three days to conduct further investigations. Mana police has deployed the special police team in order to ascertain the evidence in response of the source of the drugs that have been recovered by Mana Police. We'll return after this short commercial break. Don't go away. Welcome back in your business news. In your daily market update, the old share price index fell to 7,553.50 points after losing 47 points while the S&P SL20 index of more liquid stocks lost 23.35 points to close at 3,042.15 points. Market turnover for today was reported at 2.9 billion rupees. Here's Dimanta Matthew with a brief report on the market performance during the day. Today we saw a further appreciation of the rupee with the mid rate of the rupee around the 189-190 mark, a sizable appreciation over the last two days. The rupee appreciation is negatively impacting the market because uh, what we have seen over the last couple of months is that with the depreciation pressure that was there in the market, most of the dollar income earning companies have been significantly 
gaining in value. However, with the sudden appreciation of the rupee, we are starting to see a reversal of this trend. So we saw the market declining on uh, Friday and today on Monday as well we are seeing a 47 point decline in the market with the index declining below the 7600 mark as well today to end at 7553 points. Turnover level continued to be on the high side closer to 3 billion rupees. The rupee has appreciated further against the US dollar today with the buying rate dropping to 187 rupees and 93 cents according to central bank exchange rates. The US dollar selling rate meanwhile reached 191 rupees and 97 cents, the first time it has dropped below the 200 mark since the 15th of March this year and is the lowest dollar selling rate recorded after the 8th of January 2021. According to the central bank, the rupee has depreciated by 6.8% against the US dollar so far this year as at the 16th of April. With that, let's take a look at how the rupee fared against other major currencies during the day. In international news, following a record single-day surge in new cases in India, the country's capital Delhi began a six-day lockdown that will see the city closed until next Monday. However, despite a weekend lockdown last Saturday, a massive 261,500 cases were reported, which has added more pressure on an already hard-hit health sector. With that, here's a roundup of what's happening in other countries on the COVID-19 front line. India's capital Delhi has announced a week-long lockdown after a record spike in cases overwhelmed the city's healthcare system. However, government offices and essential services such as hospitals, pharmacies and grocers will be open during the lockdown, which starts at 10 p.m. tonight. Although a weekend curfew was imposed last Saturday to curb the virus spread, India reported a single-day spike yesterday with 261,500 new cases. India has been reeling from a deadly second wave since the start of April. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Angela Merkel received her first shot of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine recently. Germany's vaccine regulator has recommended limiting the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine to those aged over 60, citing risks of a rare clotting condition. Questions over the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine as well as another viral vector, one made by Johnson & Johnson, threatened to undermine public confidence in the low-cost shots, which authorities had been counting on in the fight against the pandemic that has claimed more than 3 million lives worldwide. Last Friday, Merkel urged lawmakers in the German parliament to approve new powers that would allow her to force coronavirus lockdowns and curfews on areas with high infection rates, saying a majority of Germans were in favour of stricter measures. In the meantime, hundreds of passengers thronged Australian airports today as an open border system began with New Zealand, a pandemic milestone that allows Australian residents to fly there for the first time in over a year without having to quarantine for two weeks. Though most Australian states have allowed quarantine-free visits from New Zealand, since late last year, New Zealand has enforced isolation for arrivals from its neighbour, citing concerns about sporadic virus outbreaks there. The open border will help drive the economic recovery for both countries and reunite thousands with families and friends. In sports, Dilhara Lokohetige, a former national team cricketer, has been handed an eight-year ban by the International Cricket Council for multiple breaches of its anti-corruption code. One of the charges pertained to him being party to an agreement or effort to fix the result, progress, conduct or other aspects of cricket matches. Former Sri Lankan national cricketer Dilhara Lokohetige has been banned from all forms of cricket for eight years after an ICC anti-corruption tribunal found him guilty of breaching its anti-corruption code. Lokohetige's ban has been backdated from the 3rd of April 2019 when he was provisionally suspended, the International Cricket Council said in a statement. As previously announced, 
following full hearings and presentations of written and oral arguments, the tribunal found Lokuetege guilty of Article 2.1.1 for being party to an agreement or effort to fix or contrive or otherwise influence improperly the result, progress, conduct or other aspects of a match. Further, he has also been found guilty of breaching Article 2.1.4 pertaining to directly or indirectly soliciting, inducing, enticing, instructing, persuading, encouraging or intentionally facilitating any participant to breach Code Article 2.1. In addition, he was also found to have breached Article 2.4.4, which deals with failing to disclose to the Anti-Corruption Unit full details of any approaches or invitations received to engage in corrupt conduct under the Code. Lokuhetege has also been charged by the ICC on behalf of the Emirates Cricket Board with breaching three counts of the ECB's anti-corruption code for participants of its T10 league and these proceedings are currently ongoing. With that we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.